you for your attention. All right, as we uh, get started this morning, we're going to be in Psalm 42. If you guys want to go ahead and get your Bibles ready, um, you can open them up there. As we enter into this world, we enter with the sound of a cry. Tears stream down our faces, our lips quiver as the chaos ensues. Although none of us remember this moment, the first sound that we uttered from leaving uh, the warm, protected confines of our mother's womb was a loud cry of protest. To cry is, is human. However, we aren't the only part of creation that groans or cries out. In Romans 8, Paul says, all of creation groans. Along with the fall of Adam, God's perfect creation was infected with sin and it was broken. And the broken effects of sin, death is the ultimate reminder in this world. But there are other examples of it. Cancer, addictions, depression, relational conflict, disabilities, anxiety, loneliness, abuse. Crying is not something that stops at birth. I mean, it continues because the world is broken. And while tears of sorrow are frowned upon in our culture, Scripture includes them in a form of prayer, and it's known as lament. And I want to be clear, like, just so we all understand, lament is not crying, okay? Lament does not mean to cry. It's more than expression of sorrow or of venting an emotion. Lament is to talk to God about the pain. And the purpose of lament is to draw you closer to him, to surrender that pain and that grief. It's the divinely given invitation to pour out our fears, to pour out our frustrations and our sorrows for the purpose of helping renew our confidence in God. That's what lament means. So as you guys have got your Bibles open to Psalm 42 this morning, um, I want to be honest and go ahead and give you guys a heads up. Today's message is heavy. As you guys are going to see, as the psalmist writes, he's in a place of grief, of sorrow. But before you get into the psalm, you see at the top of the psalm, there's this phrase for the choir director, a psalm, and there's a little asterisk beside that in your Bibles, of the descendants of Korah. And in your Bible, that asterisk, what it means is, hey, there's a footnote. There's something important about this particular word in the original Hebrew language. And, 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 and what this word is, is it's a word called meskil. That's, that's the Hebrew term. And it's a transliteration of another word from Hebrew, which means instruct. Okay? Now, a transliteration, when they tried to bring the Hebrew language into English, they didn't have vowels. And so it makes it a little bit harder. And, and this word meskil sounds very similar to this word that, that is read as instruct. So the, the way the, the, the heading of this should read for us is it's for the choir director. It's to give an instruction to the descendants of Korah. And, and it's written by the sons of Korah. Now you guys are sitting there going, okay, Greg, you've said Korah like eight times. Who is, who is Korah? Well, in Second Chronicles in chapter 20, verse 19, you see that the people of Korah are descendants of the Levites. Like, they are a part of the, the, the family, the Levitical family, and, and those, the Levites, are the priests of Israel. They are the ones that, that would lead Israel in worship. When you, when you brought your sacrifices to the altar, the priest, the Levite priest, was the one that would, would prepare that sacrifice and help lead Israel in worship. So their job was to lead in the singing and in the sanctuary. And you're going to see that throughout this psalm. And so if you, if you pan out a little bit and you think about that, it's to give us an instruction through song and hymn uh, in the sanctuary. That's, that's what they're doing. And what's beautiful about this psalm and all the psalms um, is the description of what takes place. It instructs us to sing. And when you read the psalms correctly, you should feel the emotions that the writer includes. The psalmist is going to lead us through a very heavy time of lament where he cries out to the Lord, and we're going to see that from the very beginning. Verse 1, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Now, track with me for a second. Here's this picture of what utter desperation feels like. Uh, Many of you are hunters in, in here. Many of you hunt deer season, all different types, like so on and so forth. I am not. 
Like I've never shot a gun. My dad didn't raise me to hunt. And it's not one of those things you can't, you have to be taught to hunt. I taught myself to fish. I didn't get to teach myself to hunt. You got to have somebody that's going with you the first little bit to teach you how. I mean, now there's probably a YouTube video of it, but you've got to have somebody that's going to help you. And, and, and growing up, I, I, that wasn't me. My dad wasn't an outdoorsman. Um, and so when you read this, if you're a hunter, you're going to know when the only time that a deer ever pants or gasps for air is out of breath um, is when it's chasing something that it usually can't get. So for example, that'd be like a buck chasing the doe to the point of exhaustion or two bucks fighting over said doe, they will fight until exhaustion sets in. The only other time that a deer will pant or gasp for air like this in desperation is after it's been shot or wounded and it's, it's, it's taking in its last breaths. That is where the psalmist is at. Like, understand, a deer doesn't just stroll through the woods panting around. That's not how it works. The psalmist is saying, This is what he's saying here. He's saying, God, I am desperate for you. I am desperate for you like a deer running for his life, fighting for his life, exhausted beyond measure. I desperately need you. That's where he starts. Like he doesn't work up to it and and talk about some stuff and kind of ease into it. No, he starts with desperation. Have you been there? Like, like, have you ever been in a place where you found yourself looking at God and going, okay, God, it's only you. Like, you know, in this moment, you can't rely on your spouse. You can't rely on your children or your parents, or you can't rely on your boss or your job or your finances. Like, it is a moment of desperation where only God can step in. Have you been there? Like, like a situation where you find out your spouse has a secret addiction. Or, or maybe there, there, there's an affair. And, and all of a sudden, this word uh, divorce is out on the table. A word that's never really been in your vocabulary. It's definitely not been discussed in your marriage. But it's there. Maybe it's your grown children. You started seeing it when they were teenagers, but you sent them to CIY. You've raised them in church like you've, you've read scripture to them. You've told them all the Bible stories. You've sent them to church camp and all the things. But as adults, they've found the world more appealing. They've walked away from their faith. And as a parent, you begin to wonder, how did I mess this thing up? Like, it, it, God, what did I do? Is it me? How did I fail? Maybe you went to the doctor and the report didn't come back good. And fear sets in as you venture out into this time of uncertainty. And it doesn't just have to be physical health. For some of you in here, it can be depression. Where you found yourself entertaining thoughts that you never thought you would entertain because of what's taking place up here. This is where the psalmist is at. Like he's standing in a place of overwhelmed grief. As a deer pants for the flowing stream, so pants my soul for you, oh God, I need you. He's in a place of spiritual depression. If you've been there, where did you turn? Where do you turn in a moment like this? What do you do when you look at your soul and it's downcast and you're going, oh, soul, what is happening? Where do you turn? How do you respond? Like the truth is, in moments like this, the only thing that will come out of you is what is inside of you. And the things that you run to the hardest, the things that you run to first, the things that you run to most when you are in the deep, dark places of the soul, that is what your functional savior is. Is it a substance? Is it, is it your spouse? Is it, is it your finances? Like, do you just go to work and work to distract yourself from it? This past week, actually the past couple of weeks, I've had some conversations with students who have been going through difficult times. And one of the questions that I asked them, uh, both separately, you know, don't even know each other. Uh, but I asked this question, I said, hey, so 
you know, I hear their story and I'm like, well, who can you talk to about that? And they're like, I don't know. What about your mom? No, I can't talk to my mom about it. Well, maybe your dad? Nope. No, my dad would just be like, no, brush it off. Well, is there like a good friend or, uh, you know, are you close to one of the adult leaders? Like, do you have a teacher or um, a coach or somebody in your life that you could talk to? No, you know, like, it just is what it is. Like, I'm just gonna go home, I'm gonna work out, I'm gonna play some video games. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stay busy. I'm gonna stay busy. If I stay busy enough, I remain distracted enough. I don't, like, it'll be okay. It'll all work itself out. Here's the thing, like, we can all hear that story of how students deal with stress. We can see others go through stressful times and compress it and push it down and be like, yeah, that ain't healthy. But what do you do? Where do you turn? When you're in a moment and your soul is downcast, and life is hard, where do you run? This is what the psalmist does, and this is what we're gonna see um, in, in a minute. Like, he's gonna be all over the place emotionally. But, but look at what he does, verse two. He says, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food for day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? So he's got people that see him and, and they're kind of like calling him out like, well, where's your God now? And I'm not a psychologist uh, I, or a counselor, but these are the telltale signs of clinical depression. I mean, the psalmist, he's not eating, He's not, he's not sleeping. And, and this is what makes the psalm relatable and real. Have you been there? Because here's the thing. When, when we are discouraged, we tend to ask a lot of big questions. And the psalmist is going to ask some really big questions. But we ask these really big theological questions when we end up in moments like this. Like, when, God? When are you going to come through, God? Where, God? What am I supposed to do with this, God? Why, God? Why is this happening? Spiritual or mental depression is an invitation for questions like these, and they flood our mind, and they keep us awake at night. And I want you to understand and hear me, church, like Satan has two primary goals in this. There's, there's two primary tools that he uses to wear us down. He lies to us, and he isolates us. He convinces us that we're okay, that we don't need any help. Like, no, you got this. And if we begin to consider asking for help or sharing what's going on in our life, the dark places of our soul, shame sets in, guilt sets in. And he says, you don't need to go talk to them about that. But what kind of Christian are they going to think you are? You can't share about the addiction. You can't share about your broken marriage. They're going to think less of you. Inadequacy, inadequacy sets in. And what this does is it causes us to isolate ourselves from good relationships. I don't know about you, but like there's been Sunday mornings where I've been like, I don't really want to go to church. Like I failed this week. And we begin to put things in place of church because we just don't feel like we can be here. Each of us, we have to take care of ourselves physically. We would all agree with that, but especially when we're going through the dark night of the soul. But here's what I don't understand when we talk about physical health. Every one of us would agree if our heart wasn't beating right or it was hurting or there was a problem with our heart, we would, we would we'd go to the doctor, right? Most of us probably go to the ER uh, before lunch. Like we would leave here and go to the ER. If there was a problem with our stomach, we would leave and we'd go to the ER. We would, if there's a problem with our foot, we would schedule a doctor's appointment for this week to go in and get it checked out. But, but here's the thing. Why is mental health so different? Like, I don't know about you, but I am one body consisting of a bunch of parts that all needs to work together. And our mental state is a part of that. My command center is important We got to get help. And sometimes it requires going and talking to a counselor. Yet, people are ashamed of going to see a counselor. I can't go see a counselor. I would go see a counselor in another state at 3 a.m. If I could army crawl in there, no one ever knew I went. 
Church, like I go see a counselor every other week. Why do I do that? Because it helps me be a better husband. It helps me be a better father. It helps me be a better friend. It helps me be a, a better pastor. Like understand if your command center is not working, there is nothing wrong with going and getting help. Because it's a tool. A counts, counseling is a tool that helps me be a better me for everyone around me that loves me and that I love dearly. Look at what we learn from the psalmist here as he continues on. He says, these things that I remember as I pour out my soul, I walk around among the crowds of worshipers, leading the great possession to the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of a great celebration. Here's what he's saying. He's like, as I look at my current circumstances, and I'm beginning to say, where are you, O God? Like he's starting to question his faith a little bit. Where are you? Why are you not here? I can't see where you're working. I've poured out my soul to you. I've laid my prayer request at your feet. Why are you not hearing me? Why are you not coming through? Here's the truth about this. We can tell where God is going by where God has been. When we look back in our life and we see where God has been, None of us in this room can see the future. We can make some bold predictions. We can predict, make safe predictions, but none of us can see or know the future. And what we can do, though, is trust in God's faithfulness going into the future of our life with our current circumstances because we reflect on the God that has shown up in our past. And that's what the psalmist is doing here. He's saying, God, even though I don't see you right now, even though you've not answered my prayer request, even though I don't feel you, as I look back over my life, you have always been good to me, oh God. The psalmist remembers God's faithfulness in his life. I walked among the crowds. I led them in worship. He remembered worship. He remembered gathering among the saints. The gospel is proclaimed. He, he remembers that. Corporate worship, like, do you realize how important it is to be in church? Like, do you, do, you, do you realize it's not just checking a box? There's something so much more than that. Each and every time that we come together, every Sunday morning as a body of believers in worship, we are collectively and spiritually standing united before the king of the universe. And guess what? Satan doesn't like it. He doesn't. Why doesn't he like it? Well, because God shows up here. God shows up and the gospel is proclaimed here. Souls are saved here. Weary burdens are lifted here. Truth is spoken here. Satan is defeated every time that the church comes together in worship. And in this broken moment, the psalmist, what does he reflect on? He reflects on coming together with the saints in worship. As tempting as it is, or as defeated as you feel, do not skip coming together. Sunday morning should not be an optional date on your calendar. When we come together, church, we are proclaiming Christ and we are looking forward to his return and Satan flees. You and I should be eager to come in to this place and worship together because we have brothers and sisters in Christ that remind us of the truth and the promises of God each and every time we come together. Look at what he says next. He says, why, my soul, why are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? It's kind of interesting because just before this, he's made some really incredible, theological, rich statements about the goodness of God. And right after those statements, like within the next breath, he looks at his soul and he says, what's wrong with you, soul? Why are you in turmoil? Have you been there? Like, you know all the, the theological or church answers. Uh, you know all, all the right answers. Like, you know that God is good. You know that he's a good, good father. And you can quote the song from beginning to end. You, you, you know all the Old Testament stories. You remember David and Moses and Abraham. And you see their faith. All of that is in your mind, but it seems to be a disconnect. The mind seems to be a disconnect from the soul, from what's going on there. This is where he's at. This is why the Psalms are so powerful, because the despair that he's in is the same despair that I've, I've found myself in before. 
I've sat in this psalm before. He goes on, why, my soul? Why are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. He's saying, what's wrong with you, soul? I'm desperate for you, O Lord. And then look at what he does. He tells his soul, hope in, hope in God, my Savior and my God. I will praise him. Even though he cannot praise him, he's choosing to place his hope in him. He's reminding himself to do that. The psalmist's hope is there. Nowhere in the psalm does, does he say, God changed my circumstances. God, um, I, I'm, I'm placing my hope in this next scan. God, I'm placing my hope in what my spouse will or will not do. He, he doesn't put his hope in his finances. He doesn't put his hope in other people or any other temporary circumstance. He puts his hope in God. And he says, my Savior and my God. Those four words, five words. It's a very simple statement, but it's huge. What he is saying here is that if I can trust you with my salvation, oh my God, my Savior and my God, then I can trust you with my temporary circumstances. That's the statement that he's making with those five words. My soul is downcast within me, verse six. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan and the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls and your waves and breakers have swept me over. Deep calls to deep. In the deepest part of my soul, Father, I am calling out to you. Oh God, the deepest places you have placed me. This is a plea. Like, like from the bottom of my soul, I cry out to you, O Lord. Look at what Paul writes in Ephesians. He says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together. He's talking to the, the church of Ephesus, the saints coming together with all the Lord's holy people. I pray that you grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all goodness of God. Can we just say amen to that text? Like Paul's prayer for the church is to grasp and understand how wide and how huge and how deep the love is of Christ for us. Deep calls out to deep. My soul is downcast. It's empty. Fill me, O oh Lord. And here's the thing, church. I, I don't know about you. Think about the person that you would say is like the, the spiritual giant in your life, the person that you look up to spiritually. I don't know about you, but I don't know a person who walks deeply with the Lord, that's deeply rooted in Christ, who has not walked through deep pain. Because the truth is, in moments of deep pain, God meets us there. And, and we come to understand and know him even more deeply as we are in our pain. A deep pain that God uses to prune. And it's because of their pain they cry out to the Lord. Like think about the saints before you, the people that you look up to the most spiritually. The psalmist, he's overwhelmed to the point of drowning in his sorrows. He says, all of your waves and breakers, they swept over me, O Lord. Like he's at the point where he cannot swim any longer and the waves, they're crashing over him. His head is no longer able to remain above the water. But look at what he says next. Each day I cry out, or each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me. And through each night I sing songs, praying to God who gives me life. Oh God, my rock, I cry. Anybody that's ever been through hardship like this comes to a point where you realize your current situation may cause you to feel like you're drowning. It may cause you to feel like, like it just can't get better, just one bad thing after another. But when you cry out to God, you realize his love is an ocean and we are all drowning in his grace. Like each day the Lord pours out his love on me. That's what the psalmist says. Each night I sing of his songs. Each moment I pray to the God who gives me life. And it looks like, 
Like it looks like in this moment that the psalmist, he's turning a corner. Like life is, is getting better. Like, like he's, he's saying, okay, I can proclaim the goodness and the love of God. Look at where he goes in verse 9. Oh God, my rock, I cry. Why? Why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? Their taunts breaks my bones. Their scoff, their, they scoff. Where is this God of yours? And just like that, it sounds like he's back to the beginning of the psalm. Like when you read Psalm 42, I have to compare it to an emotional roller coaster. I think that's the best way to explain Psalm 42. Each of you have either ridden a roller coaster or you've been at a park and you've seen a roller coaster. And, and when you think about it, as you're going up, you get on the roller coaster, you're going up, you hear the click, 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 click. You're looking around, you're getting excited. There's excitement there. People are talking, they're laughing. There's a breeze going through your hair. As you get up to the top of, of the, the hill, before you drop, everything kind of pauses. You have this amazing view where you look out and you see more than you could see from the ground. But then you start going down. And everything changes. All of a sudden, the sound of the track, it gets louder and louder as the coaster picks up speed and the light wind changes to a gust in your face. The casual riders, they begin to scream. And that view changes. And it becomes a blur as a race around the track happens. This is a depiction of the psalmist's life. Wave after wave, hill after hill, up and down he goes, emotion after emotion, like one moment, God, you are my rock, God, I sing to you, but then the next moment, God, why have you forgotten me? Where are you? And then for a third time, he says this in verse 11, why, my soul, why are you so downcast? You're so, why are you so disrupted within me, disturbed? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Three times he said that. Three times. Look back over the psalm. Three times he's asked this question. Why are you so downcast? Verse 5, verse 6, and verse 11. He says, why are you so downcast? And look at what he does each time. After he makes that question, after he makes that, he, after he says that, he makes a, a statement of faith. Each time he reminds himself, your hope is in God. He's preaching to himself here. He's, he's telling himself, reminding himself of God's promises, even in the midst of, of his downcast soul. Church, there are times where we have to remind ourselves. We have to speak truth to ourselves. Sometimes we need people to speak truth to us, but other times we need to be reminded by reminding ourselves of the promises that we have in God. Like it might sound a bit odd, but how easy is it to forget God's promises when life is coming at you wave after wave after wave? How easy is it to become distracted and shift our hope from God's abilities and his promises to our abilities in those moments or to someone else's abilities or to our finances or to something else? See, Satan is constantly working to deceive us and he's working to create doubt in us. Like you'll never be good enough. You really screwed up this time. God, God's over you. Your marriage will never be fixed and it's all your fault for what you did. You're never gonna be able to recover here. You deserve what you got. Like lie after lie after lie. Satan has those on repeat. Like understand. Somebody said to me in between services, like Satan deceived the angels to leave heaven. Like understand that's his game plan and he's good at it and he's fine with the long game. And it's in those moments where we begin to accept the lies as truth in our own life. And the psalmist, look at how he combats that. He speaks truth to himself and he says, put your hope in God, soul, for I will praise him, my Savior and my God. What do we do? What do you do when your soul is downcast? The psalmist, what he does is he says, he reminds his soul, hope in God, and he worships his way through the storm. 
Several years ago, Abigail shared with me a, a story of a little boy named Cole. Uh, you could see here on the, the screen behind me, Cole's mom, Erin, um, she went to high school with Abigail. Um, and you see his dad, Clint. Cole's the one that's got his hat on backwards there. On April 22nd, 2020, Aaron and her husband, Clint, learned um, their just-turned-two-year-old son, Cole, had stage four neuroblastoma, which is a, a very aggressive childhood cancer. And, and this is an update that they shared when they figured out what was going on. This is from Clint. Today we learned the official diagnosis, stage four neuroblastoma. Today has been a lot to take in. And it's daunting to look at as a whole. However, we know that God has us in his arms. And we are giving this up to him. We are, we are going to him daily, asking for our manna, our daily bread, to take on the challenges for the day and not a moment more. This is scary, but God has given us the peace that surpasses all understanding. Now the Henderson family, they began the battle under unusual circumstances because almost one month before Cole's diagnosis, COVID was introduced to America and the pandemic happened. And Aaron and Clint, they would have to navigate this treatment one parent at a time alone. Friends couldn't come and visit them. They couldn't be in the battle together. The hospital only allowed one guardian per patient. So Clint would update their family and friends through a website called Caring Bridge. And regularly he would share the words referencing the battle that was going on. Cole's favorite song to play uh, as he battled cancer was a song called Sea of Victory. And, and he called it the Cole song. As his family battled, they prayed for the Lord's victory. And over the course of almost a year, just a week before Cole's third birthday, Cole's body began to succumb to the disease. And so I, what I wanna do is just take a second because when we talk about lament, sharing grief, going before the Father with it, it's Clint's words that I wanna read to you. This last update written to all that followed Cole's story in the battle for this family from the beginning. It's very intimate, but I wanna share it with you and it's heavy. On February 20th, 2021, Clint writes, Cole gained his wings this morning at 1 a.m. I write constantly for work. I write emails, notes, proposals, and more. Using words and being a storyteller has been some of my favorite parts of life. However, those words above are the hardest words I've ever written. And this next chapter in our life will be the hardest ever written. But I owe it to Cole to tell his story. As I mentioned in our last post, Cole's cancer not only relapsed in an original spot, but it also spread to some new areas, his lungs. His cancer, neuroblastoma, is a cold disease where we were warned with the original diagnosis last April that Cole's odds for survival were roughly 50-50. We were also warned that this type of cancer had about a 50% history of relapsing and that, that relapse was always harder to treat. So we made this decision this past Thursday afternoon to fight and to give Cole a chance. So Thursday night, he received two doses of chemotherapy and the plan was to continue to doing that regimen another four or five days. The outlook was tough and it was extremely uphill as the lungs were heavy with this disease, but there was a chance. Cole had already been on a ventilator since his biopsy surgery on Wednesday, but late Thursday going into Friday morning, the lungs were beginning to struggle to keep up. The team, they fought like crazy with the ventilator all night long and in the early morning hours and eventually moved him to a more powerful machine called an oscillator. However, the, checks, the chest x-rays Friday morning in the early hours confirmed the reason for his struggle. The cancer was extremely aggressive and it had taken over most, if not almost all of his lungs. I could see the look on the faces of the doctors. I could see it in the nurses as they tried to stabilize our boy. 
this was, this was not going to end the way that we wanted. We had a hard conversation with the team later that morning and Cole's sweet oncologist confirmed that there was no need to continue, to get, to continue chemotherapy. Those words were hard for us to hear just as they were hard for her to say. However, everyone agreed that we were not going to let Cole suffer nor prolong his fight once the outcome was clear. And this amazing team, they sat with us, they talked to us and they cried right beside us as we discussed what the next steps were. We wanted our boy, our coal bear, to be at peace and not to suffer. The plan was made that Aaron and I, we spent the rest of the day sitting beside him and, and loving on him. As time drew near, Aaron and I played his favorite song. We gave him a bath so that he would know that he was loved. We followed the bath with lotion and as Aaron was holding his hand, rubbing the lotion on his arm, he gave her finger a quick and soft squeeze. We pray that that was Cole giving Aaron a little bit of peace and saying, I'm okay. After that, we laid with him a little bit longer. We gave the approval for the team. And the room was filled with people who truly love Cole. Aaron and I had sat up in bed as the team disconnected him so that we could hold him, that we could love him, and that we could rock our sweet boy into heaven. And then we played his song. As we held him, we played his song, Sea of Victory. It's known in our house as the Cole song. And we held him so that he would know he won. And Cole saw that victory a few minutes later. Thank you for caring and to read our son's story. Thank you for loving him. Let Cole's story be an inspiration to you today to, and every day. Do not be of this world. Be like Cole. Cole would have turned six years old on April 10th this year. And instead he is celebrating three years in eternity. Over the past three years, the Hendersons have founded a nonprofit. It's called Cole's Victory Lap to support other families with sick children. They recently broke ground to expand the hospital in Greenville, South Carolina to include an official children's wing. Clint and Aaron, along with Cole's older brother, Daniel, they welcomed a new little sister, Lucy, in January of 2023. Abigail is still connected to Aaron and they catch up often. And when they do, they always talk about Cole. Cole lived and was loved deeply. This family grieves the loss of a child and, and a brother, but they live in the hope of the victory that is coming. The words that, that, that Clint shares, that's a lament. It's a time where there's overwhelming grief and overwhelming sorrow that draws them closer to God. This morning, if you find yourself in that position where you're going, why soul? Like, why are you so downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Remember what the psalmist said after that. Put your hope in God for I will yet praise him, my savior and my God. Put your hope in God. That's the example that we see. Worship him through the pain because one day we will all see a victory one day we will all stand in the glory and the presence of God and it'll be a victorious day and that's what we are reminded of 
to put our hope in him. This morning as we stand, I wanna pray over you. If you need prayer, I'll be up here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy and we thank you for your love. Father, we thank you that you felt grief and you felt sorrow. Lord, that we can open up Psalms and that we can be encouraged. We can be lifted up. We can be filled. Lord, I thank you for Cole's story and the testimony that his family gets to stand on. God, I, I just, I pray that you go before us, Lord. And now I just ask that moments of grief, moments of sorrow, they are not, we are, we are, they are coming our way. We are not exempt from those just because we follow you. But Lord, I just pray that you meet us there, that you encourage us, reassure us, and put people in our life that surround us. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.